Hawkins, and I have a story to tell. A story of adventure. It all began with a map. This map showed the location of an island and buried treasure. Men were setting off on a ship to find the treasure, and I was to go along as cabin boy. An old sailor with a wooden leg got together a crew. He was our cook, and gee, I liked him right off. But what a funny name. I'll never forget it. Long John Silver. We worked all one night getting the ship ready to sail. The whole crew worked and worked and worked. Then just before dawn, we were ready to sail. We were on our way to Treasure Island. Once at sea, we all had a fine time. Long John Silver especially was lots of fun. Golly, he used to sit and tell me stories by the hour. It sat on his shoulder and screamed. <laughs> Now, there was a barrel of apples set out for the men. And one night, I went to get myself an apple, but because they were almost all gone, I had to climb right into the barrel to get one, right down to the bottom. Then a strange thing happened. Just as I was about to climb out, I heard voices. Uh, keep your eye peeled for that. It was Long John Silver and some of the crow. Now, Milanis, you're a smart lot. No need for us to return empty-handed. We'll come back with all the treasure for ourselves. Gosh, these men were pirates. <coughs> but I knew their secret if only they didn't discover me. See ya, mateys. Have an apple. <gasps> but just as Long John was reaching into the barrel... Long ho! That's it, lads. Treasure Island. The whole crew went ashore. Loyal crewmen in one group, pirates in another, all looking for the treasure. Pretty soon, I was all alone in the jungle, when all of a sudden, from behind a tree jumped the strangest man you ever did see. <laughs> he was laughing and laughing and laughing. <laughs> and all at once, he stopped. Who are you? M -m My name is Jim Hawkins, sir. Well, I'm old Ben Gunn, and you're a pirate, aren't you? Oh, no, sir, no. Well, I know that pirates are here looking for my treasure, but they won't find it. I've lived in this island for three years, hiding that treasure. They won't find it, no. <laughs> no, they won't. <laughs> It's Long John and me crew. And now, Ben Gunn, take us to that treasure. Long John and his pirates had surrounded us. Ben would just have to take them to the treasure now. Our only chance was to have the loyal crew find us before we reached it. Ben Gunn took us to the far side of the island and pointed to a cave. <laughs> I'm afraid you've done this in Long John. Right, Char, and the treasure's mine. Long John grabbed a hook and started to pry open one of the chests when... What's that? Our loyal crew was fighting the pirates. Long John and his men were captured. The treasure was safe. Our men tied up Long John and his pirates and then loaded the treasure aboard our ship. Diamonds and pearls and silver and gold and every treasure you could think of. So much that we just couldn't carry it all. So today, if you should happen across an island and find a cave, you too might find buried treasure, because that's Treasure Island! Many centuries ago, in the ancient country of Persia, there lived two brothers. Qasim Baba was wealthy and lived in a big house, while Ali Baba was poor and only had a small dwelling near the edge of town. Every day, Ali Baba went into the forest to work as a woodcutter. One day, while working in a new grove of trees, he heard the sound of horses' hooves. 
Knowing robbers had attacked people in these woods, he cautiously climbed a tree to watch. There, in a clearing by a huge rock, he saw a band of thieves. He counted 40 in all. The leader faced the rock and called out, Open sesame! And a strange thing happened. Alababa couldn't believe his eyes. The rock had opened up like a giant door, revealing a cave beyond. The thieves marched into the cave carrying their sacks of stolen goods. Alibaba realized what he had discovered. It's the thieves' treasure hideout. Soon the 40 thieves returned from within the cave. After mounting their horses, the robber chief shouted, Close sesame! And the rock door swung into place, leaving nothing to reveal the hidden wealth sealed inside. Then, while the amazed Alibaba watched, the thieves rode away Soon, Alibaba got enough courage to go close to the rock and try the magic words. Open, sesame. The door obeyed. Nervously, he went inside the passageway. It led him to a giant cavern filled with chests of jewels and bags of gold and silver. Never had Alibaba seen so much treasure. But he knew now he had learned a dangerous secret. If the robbers found him here, they would slay him on the spot. Quickly, he gathered up two sacks of gold and dashed out. Close, sesame. Alibaba hurried for home. He told the story to his wife, but she said it was wrong to keep the money. It was stolen and must be returned to its true owners. But Alibaba was afraid that if the news got out, the robbers would know that he had found their secret hiding place. So he went to his rich brother, Kasim for advice. He told him the complete story, even the secret words. Open sesame, eh? My dear brother, tell no one about this. You were wise to come to me. I will decide what to do. But the greedy Kasim decided to rob the cave himself that very night. The sight of the treasure was more than he'd expected. He began gathering and counting stacks of money. His greed caused him to forget the danger he was in. <laughs> I shall be richer than a Maharaja! The bandits had returned. Kasim Baba cringed in terror as they crowded around him. The angry thieves beat Kasim with swords and clubs, then left him to die, tied to a post as a warning to others who might want to steal the treasure. The next day, not finding his brother at home, Alibaba decided to go to the cave once more. Inside, he found his brother half dead. Kasim, what have they done to you, my brother? But the brother could not speak. I. I must get him to a doctor at once. Later, the robbers returned to their cave and found their victim gone. Someone else knows our secret. Go to every doctor in town and find out who has treated a wounded man. So the 40 thieves went to track down their captive. Early that evening, an oil merchant stopped at Alibaba's house and knocked on the door. Please, sir, may I stay the night and leave my oil jars in your courtyard so my donkeys can rest? Oh, please be my guest. You are welcome. Forty oil jars lined the walk to Alibaba's house. But only one jar contained oil. The others held a thief. For the merchant was the robber chief in disguise. Remember, only when I give the signal will you come out. Then we will destroy Alibaba and his whole household. Later that evening, while Alibaba's wife was serving the meal, she noticed a hidden dagger in the sleeve of the merchant. This must be a thief, she thought. Our lives are in danger. She ran out to get help when the voice called out softly, Is it time? Not yet. She peeked into each jar and found someone hiding. When she saw the last jar with oil, she had an idea. With the help of two neighbors, the oil was brought into the kitchen to boil. Then, as the neighbors carried the oil, Alibaba's wife dropped ladles full of the hot liquid into each jar. Out popped the thieves in pain and terror. Confusion turned to panic, and the thieves were routed. Off into the night they sped, never to return. What is that? Alibaba and the disguised robber chief heard the noise. My men have come out early to destroy your household, so now I must make short work of you. But Alibaba's wife and the neighbors captured the robber chief in one of his own jars. With the danger from the thieves past, Alibaba turned over the secret treasure to the authorities. His reward from the grateful citizens was so large that Alibaba and his family were comfortable for the rest of their lives. When all the treasure was gone, 
the mysterious cave door closed, never to open again. Five hundred years ago, there were people on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, but neither knew about the other. On the western side, our side, the people had reddish-brown skins and lived in huts or wigwams. On the eastern side, in Europe, the people were white-skinned. They had learned how to build houses and large sailing ships, but they still didn't know much about the rest of the world. In fact, most of them believed the earth was flat. Then one day, a map maker named Christopher Columbus had an idea. Do you know what? I think the world isn't flat at all. I think it's round like a ball. Did you hear what he said? Did you hear what he said? He said that the world is round. Oh, he's crazy man. I think the world isn't flat at all. I think it's round like a ball. The world's as flat as the brim of your hat, and that is very plain. I know that I'm right, oh, I know that I'm right when I say that the world is round. Oh, I'm right, oh, I'm right. My thinking is sound and I'll prove the world's round. It won't take very long. But it did take long, seven long years, before Columbus could convince a king or a queen to let him try out his idea. Then Queen Isabella of Spain agreed to supply the ships and men for his trip. I will discover a shortcut to India and bring back some of the great wealth I find there. And I can do it, for I know the world is round. And instead of going east to India, I shall sail west and reach India around the other way. It will be a shorter and cheaper way, for I'll do it all by sea. Queen Isabella provided Columbus with three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. And on August 3rd, 1492, they set sail across the unknown Atlantic. High on the foaming tide Over the ocean Onward our ships will ride Onward my sailors The ships sailed onward, but two long months after they started, there was still no sign of land ahead. until we find India. Onward, men! By October 10th, the sailors and the crew were ready to take matters into their own hands. If Columbus won't do as we ask, we'll put him in chains. And we'll turn the ships around ourselves. Wait, have you heard? One of our men has just seen a branch in the ocean. What of it? It had fresh berries on it. That means we're near land. Hooray! Two days later, the ships reached land, and Columbus and his crew saw the people with reddish-brown skins who lived there. Oh, I think it is rather surprising that they should have reddish-brown skins. But now since we have landed in India, then these people must be Indians. We'll call this part of India San Salvador, and I take possession of it in the name of the King and Queen of Spain. The people Columbus called Indians were very friendly, and they gave Columbus and his men many gifts, but not the rich jewels and gold for which they had come. For Columbus really wasn't in India at all. He was on one of the islands off the coast of America. But because of Columbus's mistake, the natives of America have been called Indians ever since. Columbus visited other islands near San Salvador, looking for the great wealth of India. And then he and some of his men returned to Spain. Hooray! Hooray for Admiral Christopher Columbus! 
Columbus had no trouble getting ships and men for his second voyage, but he still hadn't the slightest idea that he was headed for the vast continent of America and that he would have had to cross it and sail over the Pacific Ocean before he could reach India by traveling west. The men of Europe were no longer afraid of the ocean. Columbus made two more voyages, and other explorers followed. But each year on October 12th, we celebrate Columbus Day, the anniversary of that day in 1492, when Columbus first sighted the land of the new world, America. Day in Persia was the most celebrated day of the year. Wonderful shows were prepared to entertain the king and the prince. At the end of the program, a lone figure stood before the king with a beautiful horse. Your majesty, I beg thee, look upon this wondrous animal. It is not real, but an ingenious machine that will carry me anywhere I wish, just by turning a peg. Well, if true, it is indeed a wonderful animal. What is the price? It is not for sale, sire, but I would exchange it for a portion of your kingdom. Well, for such a trade, I must know more about this horse. My son, Prince Prama, will test the animal for me. The owner started to show the prince how to control the horse. But before he could tell him all, Prince Prama turned the peg and away he flew. He doesn't know how to bring it back. It's a trick to kidnap the prince. Throw this man in jail until my son returns. As the horse's owner was taken away, the king scanned the skies for the flying prince, but he was out of sight. High above the clouds flew the enchanted horse with the frightened prince. He traveled hundreds of miles, but he couldn't control the animal. He twisted the peg, but the horse continued to fly upward and onward. At last he found a small knob behind the animal's ear. He gave it a turn, and the enchanted horse started to descend. As he came closer to earth, the prince saw he was in a strange kingdom. I will be in danger if I am found, but I can't control the horse. The amazing animal carried Prince Prama toward a palace courtyard. After I land, I'll turn the peg, and maybe it will fly away again, perhaps right back to my own country. So intent was the prince on the controls that he didn't watch the archway through which the horse flew. He was knocked off the horse into a courtyard. No one saw him, and while everyone crowded about the mysterious horse, Prince Prama hid in a room. After studying the horse, the king gave out an order. This is a most unusual animal. I shall give it as a gift to Princess Serena. Yeah, perhaps then she'll be my bride. Take the animal to the stable until I'm ready to give it to her. Prince Prama could hear the king's orders, and now he realized his chance of escaping was gone. Then he heard someone sobbing. He discovered that he was in the room of Princess Serena. She was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. She looked up and saw the prince staring at her. Who are you? I'm Prince Prama. I come from far away. Don't let them know I'm here. Oh, did my father send you to rescue me from King Agnir? No, but perhaps I can help. Tell me how you came to this place. Princess Serena then told Prince Prama the story of how she was captured by the powerful King Agmir. She must marry him or be put to death. I have an idea. If you pretend to be ill, the king will have to postpone any decision until you're well. I'll hide out in the city and return when the time is right. The princess agreed, and she acted as if she were in a trance. And soon the whole palace was alarmed. Word got to the king about her illness. Send for the best doctors in the kingdom. Each doctor who came tried to cure the young girl, and each failed. King Agmir sent out a call to physicians from other lands. One day, a strange doctor came to the palace. I can cure the princess, but I must attend her alone. When the doctor was alone in the sick girl's room, 
He spoke to her. Princess Serena, arise, for it is time for us to leave. Prince Prama, it is you? Yes, Serena, but we must play the game for a while yet. Now we will see the king. Sire, you see she is almost cured already. Now, some special unusual gift from you may complete the treatment. How fortunate. I have been saving a most unique horse to give to the princess. So the enchanted horse was brought to the palace. It's beautiful. May I sit in the saddle? Of course, my dear. It's yours. Prince Prama held Princess Serena up on the horse. Then he turned to the king. You see, sire, she is cured. Now for my fee. Of course, good doctor. What is your wish? I wish the princess myself. He jumped behind Serena. Never. She is mine. Guards, seize him. But the guards gaped in wonder as the horse rose from the floor and soared away. Out over the fields and mountains, the prince and princess flew. After many hours, Prince Prama looked below and saw the palace of his father. The enchanted horse had brought them home. The king was delighted to see his lost son and welcomed the princess. Prince Prama told his father that Serena had consented to be his bride. The happy king released the owner of the horse and granted him a part of the kingdom in exchange for the animal. Later, when Prince Prama and Princess Serena were married, the king gave them the mechanical animal as a wedding gift. The young people rode away to have many more wonderful adventures with the enchanted horse. Hundreds of years ago, the good King Richard, known as Richard the Lionhearted, left England to take part in the Crusades, the war against the heathens who had captured the holy city. In his absence, he placed his brother John on the throne. As soon as he was king, John turned on the good nobles of the kingdom, stole their goods, and drove them out of England. Among these nobles were the old Earl of Huntington and his son, Robin. Father, I've come to say goodbye. Robin, where are you going? To Sherwood Forest. King John has declared me an outlaw, and an outlaw I will be. In Sherwood Forest, Robin Hood banded together with other young men like himself, banished by the wicked king. Men like Will Scarlet. Outlaws we are, Will Scarlet but outlaws such as never were before and never will be. Just how do you mean, Robin Hood? I mean this, Will. No, let me show you. Do you see those two fat men coming down the road? I see them. A couple of merchants, rogues and wealthy. And do you see that old woman in rags, weeping in sheer hunger? I see her too. Well, watch. And keep a hand to your arrow in case I need help. <laughs> And so quickly, they became known far and wide. Robin Hood and his merry men of Sherwood Forest, taking from the evil to give to the poor, defenders of the weak and oppressed, the one hope of England's people. Sometime later, Robin set off by himself in the forest. He started across a bridge which lay across a stream a bridge consisting of a single log of wood. But facing him, blocking the way, was a stranger, a tall man with broad, powerful shoulders. I'm afraid there's only room for one of us to cross at a time. I think it ought to be the better man. Stand and fight! <laughs> with only wooden sticks as weapons, they fought long and hard. Finally, with one quick, powerful motion, the stranger knocked Robin Hood into the stream. Ah! <laughs> well, well done, fellow. <laughs> but, 
What do they call you? John Little is my name. John Little? <laughs> well, I'll call you Little John. And I want you to join my band as my next in command. And now the band of merry men was complete. And just in time, for King John had posted a reward of 10,000 pounds for the capture of Robin Hood. And none was trying harder to win that reward than the Sheriff of Nottingham. Robin, I have news. The Sheriff of Nottingham is staging an archery contest with a golden arrow as the prize. A golden arrow? What a prize. His purpose in holding the contest is to lure you there. Ah, uh, that may be, but I shall go anyway, in disguise. <laughs> You, that beggar over there, get out of the way. I? Why, I'm one of the marksmen, sir. You? A marksman? <laughs> That's rich. <laughs> one by one, the finest bowmen in the land shot their arrows. Finally, one arrow lay in the exact center of the circle, a bullseye. Hey, Not yet competed. You? Well, maybe it will bring us a laugh. Robin let fly. <laughs> a perfect shot right on top of the arrow in the center, splitting it down the middle. Robin had won. A shot like that? Only one man in all this land can shoot so well. Robin Hood. After him. Catch him! But the sheriff was too late. Robin was already speeding back to Sherwood Forest. As Robin entered the forest, a knight appeared and challenged him. In the midst of their battle, the knight suddenly put down his sword. Enough. Enough. I didn't recognize you. What? Why, it's your majesty. King Richard the Lionhearted, back from the crusade. Robin Hood, your exile is over. You and your men, come back to your homes. But Robin Hood and his men declined the king's offer. They preferred to remain in Sherwood Forest together, living their adventurous lives, taking from evil men to give to the poor. Bunyan was just one month old. He placed his baby hands around a young maple tree and tore it out of the ground roots and all. When he was only 18, he was already 25 feet tall and weighed 800 pounds, all bone and muscle. He took one look at the deep forests of the West and found his job to chop down the trees to make room for cities, farms, and people. Come all you sons of freedom that run the forest stream. Come all you roving lumberjacks and listen to my theme. We'll cross the roaring rivers where the mighty waters flow. 
and we'll roam the wild woods over, and once more a lumbering go, and once more a lumbering go, and once more a lumbering go. We'll roam the wild woods over, and once more a lumbering go. Paul Bunyan was so tall, he covered miles with every step. Why, one day he started walking across the country. He walked across Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and then stepped into the state of Wisconsin. There, he met an old farmer, his head bowed down with grief. The farmer told Paul his story. I'm going down the road feeling bad. Oh, my crops have failed and now I'm feeling sad. My family is hungry and we have no place to live. I'm going down the road feeling bad. And with five blows of his axe, Paul Bunyan cleared a space of 10 miles for a brand new farm. Thank you, Paul Bunyan, cried the farmer. You're welcome, said Paul, as he took an extra big step and walked from Wisconsin into Montana. Yes, Paul Bunyan did some remarkable things, all right. As a soldier in the Revolutionary War, he faced a whole line of cannon. As the Hessian soldiers fired at him, he picked up a tree trunk and batted their cannonballs right back, like baseballs. Once, when pirates were roaming the east coast of the United States, he splashed his foot in the ocean and started a wave that sank the whole pirate navy. Oh, and I almost forgot, he also built the Rocky Mountains. Paul grabbed the hill with either hand with a ring ting a tim ring a tin on nay and set them down so they would stand in a row. He built the Rockies up so high the topmost peak held up the sky with a ring ting a tim ring a tin on nay. Then came the biggest job of his life. The country had no inland waterway large enough for big ships carrying heavy freight. So, Paul Bunyan began to dig. Soon, he had scooped out hundreds of miles of earth. Now he wanted rain, so he clapped his hands together. And down poured the rain. Until the holes in the earth were filled with the Great Lakes. La, 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 la. Now, one of the Great Lakes was named Lake Erie, and the town of Buffalo was on its shore. It took just another day's work for Paul Bunyan to dig the Erie Canal from Buffalo to Albany, and the inland waterway was completed. In his later years, with his big jobs done, Paul Bunyan went back to one of his favorite hobbies, mountain making. Boop, 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 boop. But this was a mountain for children, a rock candy mountain. All the buzzing of the bees in the popcorn trees near the chocolate ice cream fountain where the jelly beans grow and the milkshakes blow down the big rock candy mountain. Oh, the children eat their fill of the whipped cream hill and no one's ever counting. There's so much to eat. Life is one long treat on that big rock candy mountain. Did Paul Bunyan really live? Well, nobody knows for sure. Oh, mighty Paul Bunyan, he lived long ago. His strength and his goodness helped America grow.
Many, many years ago, when the people of Israel were a great nation ruled by King Saul, they fought a long and bitter war against their ancient enemies, the Philistines. In those days, soldiers used swords and spears and bows and arrows, and they wore heavy armor and carried shields to protect themselves in battle, so that only the biggest and strongest men were taken into the army. Well, in this war, the Israelites and the Philistines were pretty evenly matched. They fought many hard battles, and each side lost many men, but neither side could completely conquer the other. Then one day, while the Philistines were camped on one side of the Great Valley and the Israelites on the other, there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion of their cause, a huge giant, taller and stronger and bigger than any man anyone had ever seen. He wore very heavy armor, and his face was fierce and cruel. So fierce and cruel that it would strike fear into the hearts of the bravest. This was Goliath, the giant of Gath. He strode to the center of the valley, faced the armies of Israel, and in a voice like thunder, he hurled this defiance at them. I am Goliath, the giant of Gath, and the Philistines have chosen me as their champion. You, soldiers of Israel, choose a man for you and let him come down here and fight with me. If he kills me, we will be the servants of Israel. If I kill him, you will be slaves to the Philistines. I defy any man to accept my challenge. When the men of Israel saw Goliath and heard his defiant challenge, they were afraid but they had no one to match his size and strength. Not one among them dared go down and do battle with the giants. Not, that is, until the shepherd boy David heard Goliath's challenge. Now David was just a boy. He knew nothing about swords and spears and fighting wars. But he was a thoughtful boy too, and a good boy, because he believed in God and trusted in him. So, when he heard Goliath defying King Saul's army, he turned to his brothers and said, In defying the army of Israel, Goliath defies God. Is there no one here to go out and do battle against the enemy of the Lord? David's brothers were first surprised and then angry at him. Go back to your flocks and leave wars to fighting men. But David wouldn't be put off. I will do it, he said. Send word to King Saul. Tell him that I will go down into the valley and do battle with Goliath the giant. When the king saw how determined David was, he gave him his blessing and offered him his own royal armor and sword. But David wouldn't take them. He wasn't a soldier. Instead, he went to a nearby stream and selected five smooth stones. He put these in his shepherd's bag. He took his stick in his left hand, and in his right hand he held a slingshot. That's all. With both armies looking on, excited and expectant, David went down into the valley to meet Goliath. They met in the middle of the valley. David looking up at the giant, confident and unafraid, and Goliath looking down on the unarmed boy with eyes full of hatred. Suddenly, the giant Philistine roared in a terrible fury. I have defied all the armies of Israel to give me a man to fight, and they have sent a boy against me. What? Am I a dog that you come against me with a stick? David answered him calmly. I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Your sword and your spear and your shield will not save you, Goliath, for this day, you shall learn that the Lord fights on the side of right. Goliath let out an angry snarl. So be it. Defend yourself, boy. Goliath the giant rushed forward to make quick work of the boy champion of the Israelites. David stood his ground. He reached into his shepherd's bag, took out one stone. He fixed it in his slingshot and he let it fly. Mm. The 
giant was dead, and the simple shepherd boy, who trusted in God, had done what all of King Saul's army hadn't been able to do. David lifted his eyes to heaven, and he whispered a prayer. of the Mississippi River, there once lived a boy named Tom Sawyer, who caused his Aunt Polly more trouble than a barrel of catfish. Tom Sawyer, you broke Judge Thatcher's window today. That toe's not sore, Tom. Get up and go to school. Tom Sawyer, stop where you are or I'll box your ears. Tom? You call me Aunt Polly? You broke the cookie jar. Truth was, Tom's mind was on other things, which he soon told to Bill Harper. Bill, meet me tonight down at the riverfront. What do you aim to do, Tom? I'm not Tom anymore. I'm the Black Avenger of the Spanish Main. You'll be the terror of the seas. We're bold, brave river pirates, starting tonight at midnight. <laughs> Look, a campfire on the island. Somebody's here. Run for it, Tom. Back to the boat. Oh, pirates don't run from trouble, Bill. Come on. Let's find out who's at that campfire. Creeping to the campfire, the pirates came upon two men quarreling with each other, Dr. Robinson and Injun Joe. A third man, a tramp named Muff Potter, was asleep nearby. Suddenly, the engine drew his knife and struck the doctor down. Quickly, the engine put the knife in the hand of the third man dozing near the fire. Why, the engine's gonna blame someone else. That tramp, Muff Potter. He'll be arrested for sure. Like startled deer, the pirates sped back to their boat and swore each other to secrecy. Only three of us know the truth, Bill. If we talk, that engine will scalp us. Muff Potter was arrested, and it looked as though the truth would never come out. Then one day, Muff Potter's lawyer hauled Tom Sawyer to court and dragged the truth out of him. Now, under oath, point to the man who used this knife that night on Jackson's Island. Point him out. It was him, there by the window, Injun Joe. <laughs> You're in a pick of trouble now, Tom Sawyer. Engine Joe's free, and he'll be after you. Cause now he knows you saw that fight on Jackson's Island. Weeks passed, and when Engine Joe failed to return, Tom Sawyer grew braver. Then, one day he confided to his girl, Becky Thatcher. It was a black box full of money. A real treasure box. Well, that's what Doc Robinson and Injun Joe quarreled over. I heard them, so I know, Becky. Where is the treasure buried? Well, there's an old barn on Jackson's Island. It must be buried in there. Let me go with you. Nope. Girl's bad luck on treasure hunts. You're just scared. I'm not. I'm hunting for that treasure tonight with Bill Harper. Ready, Terror? Ready, Black Avenger. Start digging in that corner where the floorboard's loose. Treasure might be there. I'll stand guard. No sooner had Bill started digging than he struck something hard. Tom, I found the treasure. I found it. But just then, Tom ran back from the doorway. Bill, let it be. Quick up the ladder to the loft. Somebody's coming, and I think it's Injun Joe. <laughs> Somebody try steal money. <laughs> I feel Carefully, Tom spliced their pants and shirts together, then tied one end to a beam. Soon, they lowered themselves to the floor. Lake it for the river, 
Right now, Tom? Wait a minute. Injun Joe must have headed for the cave on the other side of the island. He's gonna rebury the treasure there. Well, let's go after him. Not me. I'm going home. Not long after, a ferry boat took a picnic crowd to Jackson's Island, and Tom invited Becky Thatcher along. Do you really think Injun Joe hid the treasure in the cave, Tom? Well, I'm not sure, but it would be a good place. Why don't we explore it right now? Suddenly, Tom tripped over something, fell to his knees. Becky, look what I tripped over, the treasure. That's wonderful. Now let's go back. Wait, I can't see the entrance to the cave anymore. Becky, we're lost. <laughs> Grimly, Tom and Becky wandered underground. They had almost given up when they made a turn in the passageway and then... Look! A light! There's the entrance! We're safe! Later on, Tom told the townspeople about the cave. They were sure Injun Joe would return to get his treasure, so they set up a guard and waited. One day, he returned and was caught. I give up. I go peaceful. Tom had helped catch Injun Joe, so he was a hero. And he had his share of the treasure, too. But all the money in the world couldn't keep him out of trouble, nor keep him from having more adventures. Panchito, Panchito, if you will look at the first picture in your teletalkie, you will see a little burro. His name is Panchito. He's the little fellow with the big ears. One day, little chicken, she clocked. The little goose, he hung. And the little pig, he squealed. But when Panchito tried to bray, out came nothing. He tried and he tried, but no hee And right away, the little animals made up a song about him. Panchito, he is a good little burro, but he cannot bray. is all same. What a shame, such a shame. Too bad for the parents of Lou Panchito. Panchito has ruined their name. Panchito. Ay, poor Panchito. His heart was so heavy like a stone. He was so ashamed he ran away and climbed to the top of the highest mountain. And when he got there, what do you think he saw? A little eagle in his nest. The little eagle was crying. So Panchito, he said, Hey, little eagle, why do you cry? And the little eagle said, I cannot fly. And when an eagle cannot fly, there is much to cry about. And when Panchito heard this, he said, Ah, oh, you poor little eagle. You are almost so bad off like me. I am a little burrow, and I cannot pray. I, you poor little burrow. Do you mind if I cry with you? No. No, little burrow. Let us cry together. Thank you. <laughs> and after they could not cry no more, each felt so sorry for himself and for one another, they decided to jump off the mountain and end it all. 
Well, Panchito and the little eagle did jump off the top of the mountain. But as they were falling down and down, suddenly the little eagle called out. Look, look, my wings, they are flying. Flap your ears, little bird, and fly like me. I can't. I can't. And the ground kept getting bigger and bigger and closer and closer and more bigger. But just before the ground got big enough to hit Panchito, the little eagle grabbed him by the tail. <laughs> And Panchito made a one-point landing, right on the tip of his nose. And the little eagle, he said... Little burro, you know what? You brayed. No, no, I did not bray. Oh, but you did. You only think you cannot bray, like I thought I could not fly. So if you think you can bray, you can bray. So what you think? Panchito did not know what to think. But he thought he ought to think, and maybe think some more. In the meantime, at the village, a big fiesta was commencing to begin. The little chicken was practicing her clock. The little goose was practicing his honk. The little pig was warming up his squealer. The band was playing pretty music, and everybody was happy. That is... Everybody but the papa and mama of little Panchito. And they were very sad. Oh, my poor Panchito. If we only had him back, we would not care if he never prayed nothing. <laughs> Listen, papa. What is it? And when the papa burro looked to see, there was little Panchito standing beside the little chicken, the little goose, and the little pig. And when the band did play, you never did hear such music. For Panchito, he joined in and brayed. Hee-haw, hee-haw. Panchito makes the biggest and most beautiful hee-haw in all Mexico. <coughs> Which goes to prove, if you think you cannot, you cannot. But if you think you can, you can. I think. <coughs> wild backwoods of a named Greece, a little baby girl, Diana, was traveling by horseback to the city of Athens with her mother and father. It was dangerous to travel through the rough, lonely country. Bands of robbers hid there. Even now, dark, cruel eyes watched little Diana and her parents as they went slowly on their way. Ahead of them was a clearing. Here, the bandits plan to seize Diana and her family and hold them for ransom. Behind the rocks and trees that surrounded the clearing, the robbers hid themselves. Just as Diana's father led the horses out of the forest, the bandits sprung out, screaming and waving their swords. Diana's father fought back fiercely, but there were too many for him. The bandits hurried to tie him to his horse. Suddenly, one robber shouted, A signal! A signal from the lookout! Hunters are coming. Afraid of the brave hunters, the bandits rushed away with their captives. But in their haste, they left little Diana behind. Only a few minutes passed. Then the hunters broke into the clearing. But they were too late. The bandits had escaped. 
The hunters did not know what had happened to Diana's parents. They asked her where she came from. She was only a baby and she couldn't tell them. Not knowing what else to do, they took the little girl home with them to raise as their own child. As Diana grew into a young girl, she learned to be a huntress. Among all the children, only her best friend, a handsome boy named Melanion, could ride as well, shoot as straight, or run as fast as Diana. She was so happy staying with the hunters and her good friend Melanion, she almost forgot she had a mother and father of her own. Diana's mother and father were held captives for many years. Finally, they escaped. In all that time, they never gave up hope that they would find their daughter. One day, a soldier who had been hunting in the back country came to Diana's parents and told them he had seen a beautiful young girl. Soon, Diana's happy parents found her, and they all decided she would go back to the city with them. Diana tried not to cry when she had to leave. She called back to Melanion, when we are grown up, I will marry you. And she rode away. In Athens, Diana went to school and grew up to be a beautiful young lady. But she never forgot her happy years in the country. She never forgot how to ride, to run, and to shoot. And she never forgot her promise to Melanion. Many young men wished to marry Diana. Her parents thought a girl of her age should take a husband. It had been many years since she had seen Melanion, so Diana, to please her mother and father, promised to marry the first young man who could outrun her in a race. Many tried, but no one could run as fast as Diana. The people of Athens came by the hundreds to watch the races. Diana was their favorite. They cheered and laughed as she sprinted far ahead of her closest rivals. The onlookers tossed presents to her. And even during the race, Diana could pick up a gift and keep running fast enough to win easily. One day, a handsome soldier stepped close to her and said, Diana, will you run against me? Diana's heart beat faster. It was Melanion. She smiled, for she remembered that as children, only Melanion could run faster than she. But her heart sank when she saw the large scar of a battle wound on his leg. They prepared to race. Knowing how she hoped Melanion would win, Diana's father gave the young soldier three golden apples and whispered something in his ear. At the line, a voice called, Go! Melanion sprang into the lead. Diana's friends cheered her on. She had to try as hard as she could. Diana began to gain. Out in front of her, he tossed a golden apple. She scooped it up. Melanion held his lead. Diana began to gain. Again, Melanion threw out a golden apple. She swerved to pick it up. The crowd cheered, but Melanion was still in front. Now the finish line was in sight. Diana was gaining. Melanion dropped the last apple. Diana reached down. The third apple was much heavier. For a split second, she slowed, then regained her speed. Just as she was about to catch him, Melanion crossed the finish line ahead of her. Though she had lost the race, all of Diana's friends were happy because she married her childhood sweetheart and lived happily ever after. time after God had created the world and made man and all the animals and birds, he noticed that people were no longer kind to each other and that they didn't obey God anymore. So he was angry. But God did see one man in the world who was kind and good and who obeyed the Lord's word. This man was Noah. 
So God appeared to Noah, and he let him hear his voice. And the Lord said, Behold, I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. I will bring a flood on the earth to destroy all flesh, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But God told Noah to build an ark and to take two of every animal in it with him to keep alive during the storm. And when Noah had heard God's voice, he was grateful, and he set to work right away to build the ark. This was a great boat with many, many rooms in it. When Noah finally finished it, he went out into the fields and woods, for he had to talk to all kinds of animals and birds. He talked to the lion and the wild horses. He talked to the pigs in the barnyard and the elephants in the jungle and the cute little kittens in his own house. Noah talked to all the animals on the face of the earth, even to the doves cooing in their nests. And Noah picked a mother and a father of each kind of animal and bird, and he told them to come to the ark. Well, when they were all gathered there, you can imagine what kind of a noisy crowd poor Noah had on his hands. What with lions roaring and pigs squealing and monkeys chattering and hyenas laughing, well, it must have been noisier than a crowd of children on the annual Sunday school excursion. But Noah was wise and gentle, and he understood about animals, so he got them lined up in a long row, two by two, and then he started them up and into the ark through the big door in the side. Uh, the bees were the last to go in because bees have a stinger in their tails, and no animal wanted to get in line behind them. Noah stored food in the boat, and then saw that his wife and his sons and their wives were safely inside. Then he shut the big door behind him, and he bolted it so that no one could get Then there was a flash of lightning, and the thunder roared as it never had before. Big black clouds hid the sun so that it was almost as dark as night. And out of those clouds came the greatest rain the world has ever known. It lasted for 40 days and 40 nights, as God had promised Noah. All the land was covered with water, and not a house or a living thing remained anywhere. But Noah's ark floated on the surface of the waters, and he and his family, and the animals who were in the ark with them, were saved. On the fortieth day, the rain stopped and the sun came out. The waters that had covered the earth began to flow back into the oceans and the rivers, and the ark came to rest on the peak of a mountain. But Noah wasn't quite sure that there was enough dry land for all his animals to live on. So he took one of the doves and let it fly out of the window. In a little while, it came back, and in its beak, the dove carried the branch of an olive tree. Noah knew that this must be a sign from God that he had restored quiet and peace to the world. So he opened the door of the ark, and he and his family and all the animals came out on the dry land, and they praised God and thanked him. Then the Lord appeared again to Noah. He promised him that he would never again send a flood to destroy the earth. And he sealed that promise with a beautiful symbol, which is set in the sky for all of us to see. That symbol, the token of God's everlasting faith in man, is the rainbow. Many years ago, the brave armies of Greece and Troy were locked in a long, bitter war. 
the Trojans had captured a beautiful Greek princess named Helen and held her within their fortress city of Troy. It did not seem possible that any man could break into the fortress city of Troy. For days, weeks, months, the Greek soldiers from their camp on a beach near the city assaulted the walls of Troy, but they were always beaten back. Then Ulysses, a great leader of the Greeks, said to his men, I have a plan. It is dangerous, but if it works, the Trojans themselves will take us through the gates of their city. At the order of Ulysses, the Greek soldiers set to work cutting down huge trees, making the wood into planks. From the towers of Troy, the Trojan soldiers watched a big building grow taller and taller day by day until it was six stories high. And when the Greeks pulled away all the work ladders and scaffolds, there stood a huge wooden horse, 80 feet tall. the towering walls of Troy, the soldiers and the people gathered to look out across the plain at the great wooden horse. They wondered what it was for, what it meant. The Trojans did not know that Ulysses and five Greek soldiers lay hidden in a dark secret passage inside the wooden horse. All through the night, fire blazed brightly on the beach. The Greeks were burning their tents just as if they were giving up their camp and sailing back home. When morning came, not a Greek ship or soldier remained. But where they had camped stood the great Trojan horse. The Trojan people poured out of the city to the beach so they could look more closely at the structure over the Greeks. The Princess Cassandra, daughter of the king of the Trojans, warned her people of this Greek gift, but no one would listen. The Trojans decided to pull the great horse inside the walls into the city of Troy itself. The Trojans tied thick ropes around the legs of the huge wooden horse. Hundreds of men took a hand at the ropes. Others lined up behind the horse. Whooping and hollering, laughing at the Greeks who had never been able to scale the towering walls of Troy, the Trojans tugged and pushed and pulled the huge wooden horse slowly from the beach, over the plains, and through the gates of Troy. In the dark, secret passage of the wooden horse, Ulysses and the five soldiers lay quietly waiting. They could feel the horse being moved. What the Trojans had decided to do, neither Ulysses nor his soldiers knew. Suddenly, after a whole day and half a night, the Trojan horse moved no more. An hour passed. Still the horse did not move. Ulysses gave a signal. The soldiers felt their way silently down the dark, secret passage, following Ulysses. Cautiously, he opened the trap door. Just as he hoped, the Trojans had brought the horse inside the walls of Troy. The city was sleeping now, and the walls were unguarded. Ulysses drew his sword. He ordered the soldiers to follow, and he dashed for the main gates of the city. The Greek soldiers quickly tied the sleeping Trojan guards, while Ulysses scampered up the sentry tower. Holding a torch high above his head, he signaled to the Greek army, which had turned around and sailed back to the beach during the night. And even as Ulysses and his men opened the gates of Troy, the Greek army was marching across the plain. Caught completely by surprise, the Trojans were easily defeated by the Greek soldiers who found their beautiful princess and took her back safely to Greece. And brave Ulysses was named the greatest of the Greek heroes.